Who would like to be challenged today? Who would like to be challenged? Give me some, give me some shout back. Yeah, I want to be challenged today. You guys want to be challenged today? Well, I'm telling you, today is going to be a challenging message for some of you. It is for me. It has been for me for a long time. Today, we're in a series entitled, What's the Big Deal? Are the things that are going in our lives, are they like acceptable habits or sinful patterns? We're in week three. Week one, like Dave spoke about earlier, I talked about lying, you know, you know what's acceptable, this and that, and really what does God call us to. Last week, Salty delivered an awesome message on anger. If you want to check those out today, we're talking about lust. Today, we're talking about sexual lust. But when we talk about these acceptable things in our culture, would you guys agree, like, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's acceptable, that we tolerate, that's like, it's not like the big ones that we know are sins, you know, like, if somebody's murdered, that's pretty much a sin, right? Somebody's, uh, you know, been through, like, very difficult things, you know, like stealing, you know, rape, something like that, there's just things, there's child abuse, stuff like that, it's just like, that's total sin. But a lot of the stuff that we got going on, we're very tolerant of the things in our lives, lying, lustful desires, you know, being angry all the time, that sort of thing. We can kind of tolerate that. But before I get into like the nuts and bolts of what we're going to talk about today, I want to read the prayer of David in Psalm 139. We've read it every week. This could be like your life verse, your life prayer to God. And if you feel comfortable, the words will be on the screen. I'm going to read it out of the Bible here. We can read it together and just pray it to God before we get rolling, cool? So here we go. Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now, what a powerful prayer, Lord. Search us, test us, show us where we're broken, show us the things that make us anxious, show us our fears, show us the areas of our life that need to change. Because it is good to go to God and have Him examine us first. Sometimes it's very difficult when people are trying to judge us and point out our problems when they really don't know what's going on. You've ever been judged? Pointed out, uh, people looking down on you. Let's go to God first, because He is the only one really that has the full knowledge of how to examine our lives. Cool? Right? So today we're talking about lust. Sexual lust. Some of you are like, that's not a big deal. It's cool, no problem. You know, we have lustful desires. You know, coming out of our culture, it's like a culture of hookup, a culture of like, you know, anything goes. It's no problem. God doesn't care. It's not affecting anyone. And a lot of people think, well, lustful, sexual lust issues, that's just a man's thing because all men struggle sexually, right? It's an all-people thing. I, I read this article um, out of Today's Christian Woman. Today's Christian Woman. They did a little survey. Basically determined that one out of six women are sexually addicted and using porn on a constant basis. Yes, I know there are teenagers here today. I'm not saying anything today that teenagers are not aware of. The number one consumers of pornography, who is it? Teenagers, 12 to 17 years old, are the number one consumers of pornography. So don't think I'm coming here preaching about something they haven't heard about. They're dealing with it. What is the age that's been determined now of when kids are exposed to porn? Six years old. The, the internet, social media, phones, it's not just, wow, it rolled up. These companies and these, these uh, apps, they're going after our kids. And they're going to snag them at a young age. If, if the enemy can get them at a young age, he's pretty much got them their whole life. You know what I'm saying? These issues of sexual lust, they're not just his problem, her problem. It's everyone's issue. And let's not be naive, the kids, myself included, we grew up wrestling with these things. It's very hard to break those chains once you're in bondage, right? Anybody say amen to that? Amen to that. So 
one of my concerns is that we're just so tolerant. Like, well, you know, that's just what happens. You know, things happen. You know, an affair is cool. You know, if you're single, you know, you're just, you got to take care of your needs. You know, it's no big deal. I'm not hurting anybody. You know, when I'm dating, well, you got to, you got to, you got to test out, you got to test out the product. Got to make sure it's fulfilling and satisfied. Oh man, oh, what's he preaching? I'm not even getting started yet, but right, I get in trouble if I go too far. But you know what I'm saying? How do you know you're compatible sexually unless you figure it out ahead of time? All of these things. And I'm not preaching at you. I've wrestled through these things myself. And if Gwen was up here, she would say the same thing. She's right here. Neither one of us have done this perfectly. We're trying to heal and grow even to this day, and I hope you feel the same in your own life. But if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I don't know anybody that's here, you can just check out because this message is not for you. Today, if you're, if you're not a Christian today, cool. Don't worry about what I'm about to preach because this is actually for Christians. And some of you aren't a Christian, you're like, man, I'm glad I'm not because you may think that when I'm done with this. But if you consider yourself a Christian, you said, yes, Jesus, I agree, I agree who you are. I'm grateful for what you've done for me on the cross. You've paid for my sin. You're like a follower of Christ. Pay attention, because this message is for you, and it's for me as well. So you're off the hook if you're not a Christian. You can just sit back while everyone else sweats it out, okay? So here we go. This is kind of this is what Jesus taught. Was, was Jesus a most like Jesus a pretty cool dude? He went around, he hung out with sinners. He was a friend of sinners. He, he went and had parties with people. He hung out. You know, when Jesus rolled out with sinners and people that weren't like him, he didn't go and become like them. He went to make an influence so they could become like him. Did you catch that? He didn't go to get into sin and, you know, get down and all this stuff to be sinful with this sinful people that he cared about. He went and hung out with sinful people so they could become like him. Don't, don't forget that. He was so loving and accepting that they, they, they brought him in, but his purpose was to change them, not him. So Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, he, was teaching, he was talking about the law because there's a lot of Jews there. He wanted, he, wanted to check them, he wanted to have them check themselves before they wreck themselves. This is what he said. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Like the law says, you don't, you, you know, you're married, you don't commit adultery, right? That's sin. Here's what Jesus says. But I tell you, that anyone who what? Can, can you guys say with me? Anyone that looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Hello, Jesus goes beyond the behavior to the heart. We often look at people's behaviors and say, well, they got issues, what's going on with this? But Jesus would always go to the heart. Man, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. Is that like, hold on, Jesus, how, how, am, I not, how am I supposed to live a life of integrity if every time I turn around I'm looking at a woman lustfully? Or you're looking at a dude lustfully or something like that. It's like you've got to check yourself. You gotta get a lean into the Holy Spirit. Is that like for you guys, is that like heavy? Like, man, that's that's pretty harsh, Jesus. For me, I think it's just too hard to preach to you guys. I mean, it's just, these are really hard messages, so I think I'm just gonna go fishing. Would, would anybody would, would you rather be fishing this morning than in church? All right, hold on. I got, I got my fishing gear. I got to get my little fishing tie on, my little hat. Getting ready for Timothy Lake. Hold on. I guess I need the mic. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me tie a nice treble hook on here. You guys know what a treble hook is? You guys want me to throw some at you and grab them? Have you guys ever grabbed a treble hook or a fishing hook? What happens? You get hooked, it don't feel good, does it? 
So let me tie a little, little fishing hook on here. I'm going to cast this out. Who wants to catch the hook? Who wants to be hooked? Sure. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm getting ready to go to Timothy Lake to show my brothers how to fish here pretty soon. Well, you know, you, you cast this bait out there. And then what, what does a fisherman do? What's on this line when I'm casting a bait for fish? It's, it's, it's bait. If you want to catch a fish, what do you got to do? You got to throw this out where the fish are. And there's bait and there's a hook on there. And you pull it out in front of the fish. And what do the fish do? What do they bite? Boom! And if you're a good fisherman like I am, any of the guys who know down at Timothy Lake, I hook them and I, I, I slay them, man. I slay the fish. So make sure weekend, weekend after Father's Day, we do a men's camp out called Band of Brothers. You need to be there. I'll take you to the, the honey hole where all the fish are. And what I do is I just cast that bait out, kind of like the enemy does, put the bait, and when I feel a little bite, wham! I hook them hard. You miss, you miss hooking them, you miss the fish. But once they're on the line, they're done. Once they're hooked, it's over. You know what I'm saying? Once they're hooked, it's over. Now how does the enemy hook our souls when it comes to sexual lust? Because once you're hooked, it's all over. And he's going to make you bleed. He's going to make you bleed. Jesus' brother James said it this way. Please listen to this scripture. You've probably heard it a hundred times. A hundred times. I want you to know. I want you to know that this is serious business. Because once you're hooked, it is very difficult to get off the hook. James 1, 14 through 15. Temptation comes from the devil tempting us. Oh, that's not what this says. Temptation comes from our own desires. Wait a second. I see a lot of you guys posting, the devil made me do it. You know, this and that. You blame your parents. No, no, no. Temptation comes from your own desires. At some point, you have to take responsibility for your own life and your own desires. Just because you've been tempted, you're trying to blame everybody else while you're getting loaded, while you're addicted, while you're dealing, doing all this stuff. We are tempted by our own desires, which entice. Would you circle that word entice? That means to entrap, allure. It means the bait. The enemy puts out the bait. We're being enticed by the enemy. It's putting it in front of us. Whatever it is for you, sexually, did you guys know that you have an arousal template? That there are things that are specific to you that arouse you, and the enemy knows exactly what's going on, how to hook you. We are, in, we are enticed. Temptation comes from our own evil desires, which entice us and drag us away from God and from each other. These desires give birth to actions. So your desires, you're hooked. It starts to give birth to actions, your behaviors, right? And when sin is allowed to grow, you play long enough, you're hooked long enough, you're messing around long enough, it gives birth to death. You're like, well, this ain't hurting no one. I mean, come on, Scott. What I'm doing is not hurting anybody else. It's cool. You're slowly dying when you're hooked, when you're wrapped up in sin. And not just sexual lust, that's for today, but you guys know what I'm talking about. This covers the whole gamut. And you're slowly dying. Dying you will surely die, is what God told Adam when he sinned. You're slowly dying spiritually, moving away from God, and eventually, physically, you will spiritually die. You got to get it somehow off the hook. 
as I showed you my fishing pole and my reel and all that stuff, you guys ever caught fish? Anybody here? Yeah. You actually catch a fish? Yeah. What's the hardest part? Really? Once you get them in and they're flopping around and we take all these kids fishing. Well, who has to come help them do something? What is it? You have to help get the hook out. The hardest part about fishing is not catching them. It's getting them off the hook without getting jabbed yourself. You know what I'm talking about. And kids are scared. They're flopping around. You're like, full confidence. Give me that fish. You know, and you do it properly through the gill and all that. But the hardest part, once you've been hooked, and you've hooked the fish, is getting them off the hook. And I'm telling you right now, the hardest part that you're going to battle for the rest of your life is getting off this hook. Because it's not just a, a moral issue. It is a heart issue. And how do we get off the hook? I mean, what happens to people to get them in this position? So I want to give you three things where the enemy hooks us and how this happens practically in our lives. And oftentimes it starts at a very young age. Number one, you're exposed. You're exposed to sexual impurity. God did not design it this way. But this world and the, the things of this world, and we have evil forces that are trying to take us out, you are exposed to sexual imp impurity. Think about the days when you were a kid, you're playing doctor, you know, you're messing around, that sort of thing. Or, you know, your, your kids got phones and they're on the internet, and they're checking things out, and boom! By the time they're six, seven years old, they've already seen porn. Or like some of us older folks, maybe one of your parents, like your dad, had a stash of porn back in this you know, closet, you pulled it out, your friends came over. Or you're just cruising on the internet and this ad pops up and you accidentally click on the ad, the next thing you know you're on a porn site. You guys know what I'm talking about? Or you got these iPhones with apps and these pornographers are buying ads on the apps that you use. Do you know, in a recent study with kids in middle school, they asked him, when was the first time you learned about sex? Well, how did you learn about sex? Two answers, TikTok and Google. Not through their parents. This is where kids are learning about sex now. This is where it's happening. Parents, this, it's, a, it's, a, it's a battle. And it's not just a battle for our kids. Our hearts are broken. Things are happening. Our kids are being exposed to adult things. All this stuff is going on. Like, it's heartbreaking. No. The parents are just as involved as the children are. You know what I'm saying? It's true. It is a war for our hearts and our minds, and God desires us back. Do you want to be back with Him? I think about this. The first time I was exposed, can I be real with you this morning? Like my, my story? Six years old. My uncle was taking care of me. He started grooming me and started sexually abusing me from the time I was six years old to 12 years old. Not only that, he was giving me drugs and alcohol. The first time I was blacked out drunk, seven years old. And most of my life, people said, that kid is out of control. There's no hope for this kid. They didn't understand what I had been through. I didn't tell anybody about it until I was in my third rehab in my mid-20s. Because you don't talk about these things, especially in church. I've had people leave our church because I talk about pornography and masturbation because it's too much to talk about. I'm telling you, your kids are dealing with it already. We, I don't think we need to like dwell on it, but we need to be honest and open with how this affects us. Create a culture of vulnerability, not a culture of shame. That's why I'm being open and honest with you. And do you want to know what happened to me at a young age? I was confused. It was a male. It was secret. Don't tell your parents. Don't tell your dad. All this stuff was just going on, and I'm living a life of secrecy from six years old. What was it for you? At some point, you, you made that twist where you started living a life of secrecy around these things. You know it's true. Do you know how many men and women we walk this out with? It is deadly, but we can break the chains. And you know the enemy. 
I just want to say this real quick. The enemy is out to take us out. You, you, you agree with that? Evil forces of this world. I mean, I'm not going to over-spiritualize it because we do have to take responsibility. But whenever um, there's potential in the young life, isn't the enemy always trying to take out those young kids, those young people, because they have the potential to change the world? Think about Moses and how Pharaoh had all the kids killed because someone was coming on the scene that could change the world for God. Think about Jesus. When, when they knew the Messiah was coming, the Word was coming out, Herod had all the kids killed and, and wounding the whole nation because the Messiah was coming. I think about our own lives, how many of us were wounded, and the enemy knew our potential. He knew the power that we would have to go change the world for God. He wanted to take us out. I feel like God has a plan for each and every one of us if we're still here today. Even though the enemy tried to take you out, he saved your life. He did this for good. He saved you. He brought you through this so He could use your story and the difficult things you've been through to turn around and shove it in the enemy's face and say, I'm going to use this to save lives. Because there are people who need to know that Christians have been there. We're not just going around spouting out Scripture and religious you know, platitudes, but like we've been there, we can walk this out. That's why we go through some of this stuff. So number one, you're exposed to sexual impurity. Number two, you're injured mentally. When you are exposed, a wound is created. You're wounded. Your mind was pure. And now it's polluted. You were innocent. And now you're like feeling guilty. And you want to know something around these sexual issues? The hardest thing I had to wrestle with especially when it gets all twisted with other people and the weird stuff. It's like sexuality and, and these things are actually a good thing from God. It feels good. There's, there's good thoughts to this, but you know it's so wrong, so you're wrestling between this is good and this is guilty and shame, and you're just all jacked in the head because it's all twisted. Do you know what I'm saying? It's very difficult to get through these things. When, you're, when your computer gets a virus, man, is there anything around it? just keeps running on, you know, it's all jacked up. Until you remove the virus, until you remove the hook. It's corrupted. That's what happens. So we have, you're exposed, you're injured, and then you're confused. There's nothing more confusing than these things in our life. When we're exposed to things we're not ready for. But it meets this primal need in us, sexually, because we're all sexual beings, right? Are we all sexual beings? Yes. If you're alive, you're a sexual being. They say the two most difficult addictions to overcome is food addiction, amen, and sexual addiction. Why? Because you got to eat, and we're sexual beings. And the way God designed us, the enemy will come in and take what is true, and he'll twist it, and enemy will grip your soul. He'll actually, the enemy will actually not just put a hook in you, but he'll put a noose around your neck. And the harder you try to pull away, what happens? The harder you try to pull away, the more you're choked out. It's very difficult to break these things. Because, you know, with the sexual things, like I said, you're, you're simultaneously like, this is enjoyable, but then there's so much guilt and shame around that. Or for those of you who are single, like, well, it's enjoyable, I'm not hurting anybody, it's cool, no one's going to know, it's not a big deal. Some of you guys in your marriages, you've been justifying this for a long time, you're like, he's not meeting my needs, she's not meeting my needs, so I'm going to take care of myself, I'll just go, I'll go get, I'll chase down one of my old, old uh, partners back on Facebook, I go back in high school, Remember one of those loved ones starts sending little messages like, hey, how are you? When really what you're trying to do is get a hookup or you're trying to reconnect somehow emotionally, which eventually probably lead to sexually. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you're like, hmm, marriage isn't good. And then some of us, myself included, will go for long times with periods of sexual purity. You're like, man, I'm doing really good. Things are going well. But then I get a little distracted. Things get bad. And then I'll just act out. And then I'm back down the rabbit hole. Oh, there goes my 
40 days clean, well, there goes this, or something like that. We have to actually be honest about our clean time. Those of you who are in the recovery world, you know what I'm talking about. And it's just this repetitive cycle that we go through. Let me tell you, if you're married today, or you have been, this issue in your sexual life, this is not a passion problem. Oh, there's just, there's not the passion like when we were dating. Once we got married, oh, then all the passion went away. Come on, oh yeah, some people know. It's not a passion problem. I want to tell you today, if you're hearing anything, you're injured. You've been injured. You brought your injuries, your woundedness, and your sexual brokenness into your marriage. Your unwanted thoughts, your unwanted desires, you brought that in. And you need to be honest about that. And I'm not just talking about our sexuality. Please broaden this out. You're bringing the brokenness of your life, the trauma, all the things into your marriage. Even though you say you want to be faithful, even though you say you want to be a man of God like I did to her, I didn't know how to do it. I was broken. My heart was in the right place. I don't know about you guys, but I'm like, I don't want to be an evil, broken, hurtful person like I used to be. I didn't even want that when I was in my addiction. That's why I kept getting loaded, kept doing things so I wouldn't have to think about what a mess my life had been. What does it look like to be injured? Scripture right here, Paul outlines it. Ephesians 4, 18-19. This is what it looks like to be injured. They are darkened in their understanding. It's not just a choice. They're darkened in their understanding. They're, they're broken. They're injured. And they're separated from the life of God. To be broken, to be in sin, is to be separated from God. Because of the ignorance, because of the injury that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. What does it mean to be wounded? What does it mean to be broken? When your heart is hard towards God and others, that is broken. That's not how God designed us. Do you understand that? Sometimes we read this, it's like a shaming guilt message. Oh, I'm, I'm so broken. No, if you could see it as you're broken and wounded, there's healing that needs to happen. Having lost all sensitivity, you become numb. Anybody here become numb? You go long enough down this path, you're just so numb, you don't give it, you don't care. You don't care about your sexuality, you don't care about how people are treated. You do you, because you're so numb, and you're hard, hard and hard, and God is saying, please come to me. I want to heal you. I want to give you a new life. You don't have to keep doing this. And they give, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so to indulge in every kind of impurity. And it's not just sexual, but man, when you get numb and you're jacked up and you don't know, you'll give yourself over to anything just to feel again. Come on. Come on. This is a picture of injury. This is a picture of brokenness. So when someone has the courage to confess, when someone has the courage to be real, I need help, I'm broken in this area, remember, they're injured. They're wounded. It's not necessarily a moral choice they make to do bad things. There's, there's brokenness in their heart and in their mind. You have to remember this first. Or you'll come across as judgmental. You'll come across as religious. Remember, God wants to heal them. So two things that you can do to heal from these lustful wounds. Two things. Number one, protect. Protect the wound. Protect your heart. Protect yourself. You've got to protect the wound. You have to um, get treatment for the wound that's in your heart, that's in your mind. I, I remember living up in Washington. We lived up in Washington at one point. And I thought I'd show off. I'd ride my bike across like a four by four across this canal. And of course I wiped out, fell and broke my arm. And, the, and I still have the scar here. But when I went in, the doctor was gaping open. He said, you've got to protect the wound for it to heal. You can't let dirt get in there. Or you can't, you, you got to bandage it. You got to do all these things or it's never going to heal properly. And for those of us who've been wounded in this area, which is pretty much all of us, we got to protect the wound. We got to start thinking about how do I protect this wound? How do I do this? Psalm 119 says this, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word, by going to God's word for this. You got to protect the wound. You got to acknowledge the wound. If, if 
pornography and things like that are a temptation. I think every one of us should have certain things and guidelines in our life, like where are you on the computer? What apps are you downloading? Who has access to your passwords? Who are you accountable to? Who has access to where you've been online? Why are you still going to questionable places? Why are you still hooking up in, in areas where you know that that's not right for you? Come on. Why are you still hiding the secrets that God wants you to confess? It's very important that we find this place where you can be humble. Like humbly say, I'm broken. I need help. And you can be honest and say, I can't do this on my own. I want to tell you something this morning. You cannot break these chains on your own. Someone has to walk it out with you. Someone has to come along with the fisherman's net and help you get unhooked. You cannot do this on your own. All these things are, grow in isolation. You must have people to walk this out with you. There's no way around it. And that's very difficult because the thing we need the most, someone to walk it out with us, is the thing that hurt us. How can I go trust somebody when it was people who hurt me? How can I trust men and adult figures when all I got was wounds and trauma as a kid? It's very difficult. But God provides those people in your life. He puts those people there if you'll be open to it. And you've got to protect the wound. When you protect the wound, God will begin to heal your mind. Come on. When you protect the wound, God will begin to heal your mind. Number two, you've got to pursue. So you protect your heart, and then you've got to pursue God. You have to pursue God. You know, when I'm not pursuing God wholeheartedly, maybe it's the same for you, I get really distracted. I get distracted real easy. You guys get distracted? Any of my, any of my brothers and sisters who've wrestled with addiction, are we not compulsive, impulsive people like, boo, man, this is real cool, all this stuff all over the place? If I'm not pursuing God and I'm not on mission and vision for Him, it's real easy to get distracted. And guess what? When you're hooked and the choke hold on you, once you get distracted, boom. There you go. You're away from the protection again. you got to pursue God 100%. And like, like Paul said, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. Once you get separated from the life of God because you get distracted, you're bored, all these things, all the excuses we make, you get separated. We have to pursue God 100%. Just like you pursue, just like we say in other things, you have to be all in. All in with God. And guess what? You know what I love about God? Even though we're not all in all the time, He's always saying, come on back to the table. Some of you today, come on back to the table. As the worship team comes up, I want some of you to, to think, man, I've been in this. I know, what this. I know what this preacher's talking about. He's not just preaching, he's speaking to me today. It's time for you to do a few things. You gotta protect your heart, protect your wounds. You gotta pursue God 100%. For me, I believe from a young age, addiction was there. I've been a wrestling with sexual issues since I was six years old. You're like, Scott, you're a pastor. Guess what? It doesn't change. You still have to guard yourself. You still have to have protections in place. You still, for me, put my computer out in the front room, open access to these people in my life, my wife. Nothing done in isolation. The minute I get isolated, boom, the enemy starts working on me. Number one, for you guys, and what I had to do, I had to be honest and say I'm broken. I had to quit blaming my parents, blaming my wife, blaming others. I had to say, I have to take responsibility for my life. Number two, I had to accept the help that was available. You guys, there's help right now. Many of you are receiving that help. I'm so proud of you for whatever area it is in your life, but the area of sexuality and sexual addiction, there's so much help out there. We're partners with Pure Desire Ministries. We have 
access to counselors, to groups, so you can really get below the surface into the root issues that are driving your addiction and driving your broken behaviors. We have that accessible to you right now. I had to do it years, you guys, years of counseling and men's groups and purity groups and just wrestling and trying to get through all the trauma that was driving my behavior. Wounded heart group where we talked about the, 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 the sexual abuse, talking about those moments and just processing the pain because I never had processed the feeling of all of that and how painful it was to have to go through that. I'm telling you there's hope and healing, but it's not going to be easy. That's why a lot of you have avoided it. It's not easy, but it's powerful. I remember many years ago, if I was going to have a healthy relationship, not just sexually, but like relationally, with intimacy, with Gwenna, with Gwenna, I had to work through the trauma in my life. I had to work through this stuff. And it was hard. But as I started did, I started to see how we were better communicating. And she walked through with me. There were times where I'm like all jacked up because I remember all these things. I'm going through this process and we're laying in bed one night and she just reached over because Gwen had never really been through this stuff just to kind of comfort me. And I jumped out of the bed because she touched my arm because I thought right there, I thought I was back in the room being abused. There's, there's, there's memories that come up and you have to work through this stuff. But praise God, as you do, we work through it. It loses its grip on you. That's how you remove the hook. You address things head on. You're at, a, you're at a church where we address things head on. And it makes some people really uncomfortable. And I hope you're really friggin' uncomfortable this morning. You probably already checked out because I'm up here sweating and getting all jacked up. Hey, I'm, I give you 100% every time I'm up here. It's like a workout for me, man. I'm like, I, I put so much in this because I want us all to experience the healing of God. I want, us to, I want this to be the last time you go through treatment. Every time I go speak at treatment places, I ask them, is this your first time? No, most of it's third or fourth time. Let this be the last time. Let this be the time where you walk into the light, into freedom. Your marriage moves to a, a new place. And I'll wrap up with this. Years ago, I forgave my uncle. I'm a Christian. God has forgiven me. I went through it, I forgave him, and I said the words, and I didn't really feel it. But I just kept going all the time, God, you've forgiven me, I'm going to forgive my uncle. He never apologized. Never owned what he did to me and so many other little boys in the town I grew up in. And it's really hard to walk through that stuff. But I forgave him. And I was at peace in my heart. I got to a place where I was at peace. I didn't have to be in a relationship. I don't need a relationship with him. I forgave him. And it healed the memories in me. So it no longer gripped my soul. It wasn't this pain. And then I asked God, give me eyes to see him the way you see him, God. For years, I've looked at my uncle with the heart of God, saying, God, if you could get a hold of him, you could change his heart. I no longer wanted him to be punished. He was punished, by the way. But I no longer held it over him. I said, God, would you please change this man? Even though he never, he never pursued me, I was pursuing God for him. And so just earlier this year, I was talking to my aunt about my uncle. She says, you know, your uncle, he hasn't, he hasn't re-offended anyone in many, many years. And I'm like, oh, really? And then I was talking to my dad who lives down there. He says, Scott, your uncle, I led him to the Lord. He's been a Christian for a long time. I'm like, really? Hmm. I started thinking about it. I started praying about it. My uncle's still alive, yes. And then when I was preaching here on Easter, I'm preaching with Jesus hanging on the cross, looking down at all the people who betrayed him, all the people spitting on him, all the people shaming him, everyone ridiculing him and mocking him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then right before he died, he said, it is finished. And then God told me, standing here in front of you, to go to your uncle and tell him, it is finished. I forgive you. I love you. Be at peace. So I held on to that for a few weeks. And then I called up my dad. I said, Dad, I'm coming down. I'm going to come down and go to the jail and minister with you, but I'm going to see my uncle. 
So I went down last weekend. I wasn't here. Salty was preaching. I went back to Klamath Falls. My dad and I went into the jail on Friday night. We ministered to the inmates. You don't know how powerful that is. But then I went to my uncle's house. Not because I felt like it. It was really scary. It was kind of awkward. I haven't seen him in many, many years. And he came out and he didn't even recognize me. I was just a no one to him. And I grabbed him in my arms. I said, how are you doing, uncle? I miss you. I said, how you been? He's like, he didn't know who I was. I go, it's me, Scotty. Because that's what my uncle knew me as, Scotty the little boy. I said, it's me, Scotty, Pete's son. Oh, oh, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm good. Not really looking me in the eyes. I said, hey, I'm, I'm married, and I have a couple kids, and I have a good life. And I showed him my phone. I showed him a picture of Gwena. And the girls said, oh, that's really cool. And I said, hey, we talked for a minute. And I said, hey, all the stuff we went through when I was a kid, the really hard things between me and you, you know what I'm talking about. I wasn't getting into all the details. He knew exactly what I was talking about. I said, I forgive you. And I love you. I heard you've changed. And he wouldn't even look at me in the eyes. I was trying to keep him looking in the eyes so he could see the love that I had for him. Love, not shame, not guilt, not rejection. And, and he was keeping it, and I'm tearing up. And I said, I love you. And I want you to be free. And we talked a little longer, and we stood up. There was no apologies. I don't even know if he could even say it. As we, as we embraced me left, I said, I love you. It is finished. Peace be with you. And then he went in the house, and I walked away. And I want to tell you something. There were no angels flying above. I bet the angels in heaven were, were celebrating. But there were no lightning bolts. It was just love. And I didn't think I could ever do that. But when God gets a hold of you with that power where you can forgive... At the right time, there's nothing better. I felt like the weight of the world was lifted off my life, and I really pray that that blessed him more than it blessed me, more than it blessed all of you hearing this today, because the power of forgiveness is what Jesus Christ did on the cross. The reason we talk about Jesus is because we need to be forgiven so that we can be reconciled to God. And the only way I was able to do that was to look at the example of Jesus. All I did was like, Jesus, what did you do? You did that, I'm going to do that. I wasn't feeling it, but God carried me through. And I hope today, if that's something you've experienced, if you've gone through any of this stuff, I pray that you would be healed. I pray that you would have the courage to take responsibility and be honest with your life, to get the counseling you need, to connect with the right people, to break the bondage of the past, to remove the hook. The only way you can remove a noose is to not pull on it. You have to cut it. That starts with forgiveness. That starts with owning it, right? So wherever you're at today, I want to pray for you. If God has touched your heart, I want you to pray with me. If he's working on you, if you need support in this, put it in your communication card. Let us know how we can support you. Everything's confidential. Would you guys just bow your heads? Father God, you are a loving Father. And this world, as you know, Father, is very broken. And we thank you, Father God, for sending your Son, Jesus, who would come and lay down his life and be an example to us how to live, how to forgive, and how to treat people. And God, I pray for each person here today, Lord, wherever they're at in this journey of wrestling with their sexual brokenness, their sexual health, whatever it is, Lord, I pray, God, that they would hear from you, that they are deeply loved, and that you want a relationship with them. Lord, that I pray that people would open their hearts humbly before you and receive your love. Quit pushing it away. God wants to heal you. Quit pushing God away. God wants to heal you as you open up and as you're honest and as you find people to walk this out with. 
Father God, would you bring healing to people today? Would you bring restoration to families? Would you show, God, every person here a way out? Lord, we need you. When fear comes, I pray that we would take it and use it for the courage to stand tall with God. No more shame, no more guilt, no more living in secrecy. Be free, church family. Be free to love God and love one another. As you walk out forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration, be free to have courage. You don't have to walk around bent over in shame, not looking people in the eyes anymore because God is empowering you. You are a new creation in Christ. You have people here who have been through it, who will walk it out with you. Lord, sometimes life is heavy. But I'm thankful, God, you're a heavy lifter. And you lift those burdens right off of our souls. Thank you, Jesus, for overcoming the grave and overcoming sin. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name.